Hi, Daphne, we're about to go live. Great. <laughs> so good afternoon, Facebook family. Good afternoon, family. Good afternoon, friends. Welcome to Seeds of Hope. We are very excited this afternoon um, to be chatting to Daphne Pillay, um, who has an incredible story, is an incredible salt of the earth woman. And we're just so excited to have you on on. Seeds of Hope this afternoon, Daphne. Welcome. Thank you. With Daphne, we have uh, Deshni Govinda, a dear friend of, a mutual friend of Daphne and myself, who is here actually to support Daphne today. Isn't that wonderful? It is. <laughs> so welcome, Deshni. Welcome. Thank you, uh, thank yeah. you so much. Thank you for connecting us. And thank you also for joining Daphne. It's so important. Um, this is Daphne's first time going live and going public with her story. And I really just want to honor you, Daphne, for your incredible courage and your, um, and your desire to help, especially women, um, in their lives. Um, so thank you. Thank you for that. Tell us, tell us a little bit about who Daphne is. Just a simple person who can, I can't say much about myself, but more a warrior who's been through a lot of struggles, who knows a lot about women's suffering because you, every kind of suffering that a woman went through, I went through. And a person whose heart is mainly for women and children, abused women and children, and just for anyone, as my father will do. Yeah, my dad will it. That is it. So tell us, thank you, Daphne. Tell us a little bit about, I mean, your warrior story started very early in life. Tell us a little bit about that. I mean, you were trained, uh, the, the, you know, your entire biological family was, was wiped out in an accident. Maybe take us back to that time in your life. I cannot uh, recall much, Anish. All I know is uh, before the accident, I remember uh, my father bringing home, my father was a she just a chef at Red Dog Hotel, so I think it was his weekend off and he bought a new car. So when he came home, he brought us all the goodies and toys and fruits and things like I can remember very well. <clears throat> then I remember we all getting into the car and visiting my granny and my grandfather. And yeah. from there onwards, when we're coming down from the, to the road, I can't recall anything, even about the accident, until the day that I woke up in hospital. And the first thing I saw, one of the neighbors, my, na my granny's neighbors, standing with two bars of chocolate, which I know very well, <laughs> two slabs of this. One was um, the fruit and nut and another old nut. So I looked at that first, because I opened my eyes and looked at that first. <laughs> And then I asked him, Uncle Babu, uh, is that for me? <laughs> he dropped yeah. everything because they all gave up hope on me, Nish. They all thought I'm going to die too because um, the, the, the ba my baby sister, my brother, my father and mother already have died. So the way I feel maybe the family also gave up hope on me. Mm. So when this happened, like this man, I don't know whether he thought I was dead and came alive or what. He dropped everything and he didn't know which way to run. <laughs> Shame. <laughs> but he just brought in the nurses and everything. And later that afternoon, my family called it. There were some injuries where I broke my, um, my hip bone in my leg. But that all healed while I was in hospital. But it also seemed like I was, um, I don't know, for days or a couple of weeks, I was in a coma. You were in a coma. How old were you then? I was five. My yeah. brother was four, and my baby sister was six months. Baby. Hmm. But you were the eldest of the, the children. Yeah. I'm really sorry for your loss. That must have been quite a quite a tragedy. And that happened in, in Tonga, right? Yes. In 1974. In 1974. 
in Tonga on the, and I guess that was, uh, the car just didn't get out of the way on time. The, you know, uh, it, from what I've heard from people, they told mm. me uh, there's usually one guy, do you know the railway station, uh, I mean, the rail, railway crossing in Tonga, that up hill there, there was usually the guy on the, on the top of the hill that Sean is touched down. So the, the, the guy that's at the bottom will raise up the, ra uh, the red flag or the green flag. So it appears that guy on the top didn't flash his flag and the, the guy at the bottom lifted his red, um, I mean, the green boat. But I can't oh. recall anything because I was, I can't remember anything of that sort. I know only from the hospital onwards and what happened before that. Yeah. And what happened after that as a five-year-old? Where did you go? What happened? Uh, I spent most of my time in hospital trying to, uh, uh, well, maybe to heal the leg or something because I'm going through a lot of tests and things. Then I, uh, my granny and grandfather took me home. I, I stayed with them. Well, there was a lot of uncles and aunties who wasn't married at the time. Mm. So we all lived together. Uh, and they gave me a lot of love and support. And, but um, they, the only thing they did is lie to me that my parents was gone to Joburg. That's where we were supposed to move to Joburg. Yeah. And they, because my father, I think he got a job that side. So she kept telling me. And so the months went on and on. Until one day I was sitting uh, and playing on the floor near my granny and I asked her about the accident. Uh, I mean, I asked her where my parents are. And then she just burst out crying. And then all my uncles and aunties all rushed in. Uh, then she told me uh, what really happened. But at that age over there, <laughs> and because of our, uh, our Christian background and knowing where our this is go. So I actually told her, uh, when my auntie, in fact, I forgot this, my auntie just told me the reason. I actually told her, uh, um, I must, she mustn't cry and worry about them because they're happy with Jesus. Yeah. And um, well, my auntie carries the story everywhere. <laughs> she likes the story. So from there, uh, they, there's always like, um, what I can say. Well, I, I went to church a lot, went to school. Then, you know, there's bickering and fighting amongst cousins. And uh, then sometimes cousins can be very cruel too. Like when they fight with you, I don't know why you are alive. You should have just died. That was the yeah. thing that really smashed me for so many years. It got me down. And <clears throat> uh, like, uh, like if you, you know, and often the children can be very cruel. The most cruel people is not parents and aunties and uncles, it's the children and school children. They can yeah. really pick you off. So <clears throat> being rejected like and not fitting in from that age, um, I went into my teenage uh, life being the same thing. And um, <clears throat> before I was 10, I was sexually molested by my um, one of my family members. And then again, when I was 16, and it continued, I mean, it continued till I was 16. Then I ran away from home. I didn't want to stay there anymore. And when I ran away from home, if uh, they don't believe me, you'll think I'm lying. But I slept in the Flamingo Heights station. I slept on banks. I had a bath in that river, small stream by the railway line. I didn't want to go back home because nobody wanted to believe me when I told them things. Did you tell somebody? <clears throat> Yes, I did tell people about it. I did tell family members, but they never believed me. I think it goes with the, you being uh, being an orphan or a fatherless child or a motherless child, that you're always ostracized and taken apart. And like if there's something missing, they'll blame you. If there's some something that's uh, like uh, not right, they'll blame you. Like I had an uncle one time when he's fighting with his wife and drinking. And he comes by me and say, you are to you I am drinking. But I didn't ever, never say. Like, I didn't do nothing. So uh, all those things build you up. And then in, <clears throat> in my teenage life, I actually, um, they start looking for me. They got so fed up, they sent 10 tourists to take me to the homes. <laughs> and I spent my, my teenage, uh, my eight, nine and metric, I spent in Newcastle. Well, that was the most safest place 
in that moment that I actually felt safe and I felt so much of joy being amongst other women and teenagers in my side. And I really enjoyed it. So when I finished my matric and came out in, uh, from that school in Newcastle, I stayed again with my granny. Then the proposal came for me. <laughs> my husband. Yeah, yeah. So just to recall, Daphne, you, you lost your family at the age of five. By the time you thought you had safety with your, your grandparents, they came this uh, abuse and molestation at from, from the age of six, and, or from the age of 10 until 16. You no, know, uh, in fact, it started before I was 10. I can't recall which, which many yeah. years, but it continued to allow us 16. So... Uh, the, the time when I built more of myself is when I was in Newcastle amongst girls and we learned a lot. And, well, my granny forced me to be place myself when I was 14. And so uh, in someone's backyard in the swimming pool, she made sure she did the wrong thing. And uh, most of my life like, has been with a Christian background, with being with like, um, forgiveness and loving but I didn't grasp it because with me, I hated the world. I didn't want to be a girl anymore. I don't want to be a girl. That's what I thought right through my life. I always like to be a tomboy because I felt like if you're a man, no one can attack you. No one can do anything. <clears throat> and um, any small thing should tick me off. I also been, after I've uh, run away from home, I've also been in drug, in drug uh, usage. I've also been talk about suicide enough times I tried that but uh, I don't know my life doesn't want don't want to go <laughs> and so there's a lot of things that has pushed me and tortured me through a lot of life but I only came to find out about peace is when I was nearly 30 years old the peace of God the healing took place there Sorry, I've got a, a storm brewing here in Joburg and some alarms going off outside. So you're going to hear it, but we're going to persevere. So Daphne, you've, I mean, I really just want to honor you for, for your courage in being able to share that with us. It's not easy sharing this depth of, uh, of your life story. Um, tell me, when you were going through all of this, when you were going through... The, the molestation, the runaway. I mean, and you were angry. You didn't want to be a woman because men were safer, you know. Uh, was there anything that kept you hopeful? Was there anything that you could hold on to? Was there anything or anybody that just, I mean, you know, you, you even your, your suicides even failed. So like, did you ever ask the question, why the heck am I still here? Oh, I can't even <laughs> tell you about my fights because from that young age, I used to fight with God and I will shout at him and I will scream. I will walk fast uh, into a, anyway, just fighting with him. Even if I was lying down in the bank, I'll look up and I'll start fighting with him. It was always like a fight, like our daughter would fight with her father, I think, for things that she goes through. But it never stopped in any way. That uh, even now too, uh, when I go through things, I don't take uh, my heavenly father, my heavenly dad, as uh, other people would say. Don't question God. Don't tell him this, don't that. But it's a relationship between me and my father. If I want to know something, I want to know it. And I don't mm -hmm. ask anyone. I will ask him. So he has to answer me. Because when he speaks to me, I can feel the peace in me. So at yeah. that young age, I, uh, although I was in all the drug things and all, I thought I should question him and I should talk to him. So yeah. that was like more like a, uh, like a let out for me. Oh, oh. And then the proposal came and you were safe in Newcastle. You were feeling safe. There were women around you and you 
you were able to finish your matric. Tell us, um, was that your Prince Charming? Was that the answer to everything? Uh, I can't tell you much, Nish, but uh, like some people go with a gut feeling. At that moment, I didn't, I didn't want to get involved. Um, well, I said, not right, so I can't, I can't get involved. She said, that's family, you have to get involved. But not realizing that um, she felt a responsibility that she has to look after me, take care of me. Yeah. So like, uh, by the age of, like, uh, uh, before I turned 22, my granny passed on because she felt it was uh, safe to leave me with uh, my husband. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I went into this marriage not with love, it's more like after my granny's death, I didn't even have any place to stay. Yeah. So it was my mother-in-law told by um, my husband that uh, must bring me over because there was uh, things that my family didn't want, they want, didn't want to deal with me. So that's how I ended up. But that never left my mother-in-law from saying, we took you from the streets. <laughs> she never left that. But after my husband died, if there's anybody that really stood by me, really looked after me and the kids, that was my mom in law, the woman that gave me so much strength. And um, it didn't matter to her what I was going through because she had been a widow too. And she had the children, she knows the suffering. She always had a heart. My in laws also, they always helped us out in many ways. Like, the, uh, I really think. Um, my mother-in-law was like a beacon after my, my, my husband died. Yeah. She was a real beacon. And tell us a little bit about how he passed away, how he died. Um, I don't really recall much, but uh, uh, I can not, I mean, it never fade from my head or something, but uh, it was my daughter's 12th birthday. So we were in, she was insisting we go for, um, you know, the spur birthday, they have the big 12 yes. thing, yeah. So they wanted, and she's saying, Every time my birthday comes and we don't go out, I said, We can go another day because my son, my younger son, my son, the elder, elder one, and I sent something's wrong. And we didn't yeah. want to leave my husband because he was drinking a lot. So um, we sent something's wrong and we told her, we, we, you know, we go the next day. But anyway, we went to, uh, for this. Um, for a thing at Spur and we came back home and I opened the door but I saw beforehand that my husband is hanging somewhere into the house. So I was praying and when I opened the door I was closing my eyes and thing and opening and see it's not there. Mm -hmm. But when we went into the house then we saw um, he cut some mangoes for the children and kept there were sausages for them uh, mangoes for all four of us in fact and sausages for them and um, the kitchen door key was missing. So I went shouting for him because I knew he must be cat here cutting mangoes for us. So we walked there and I just turned and I saw just two legs that was moving up and down, just hanging from the tree. <clears throat> so when I started screaming, my daughter came in and I could hear her saying, Mom, Daddy, why did you do this on my birthday? And then my other son came in, six year old, and then the baby was left inside. He was screaming and crying, so we had to go get him, and then we started calling help. And he never left a note or anything to say uh, what really happened. So up to this day, yeah, we're still all in medicine. We're all still in medicine. We still don't know. That must have been really difficult. Yeah. 17 years ago, and, and you then had to raise the children yourself, Daphne. Yes. Um, at first, uh, my in laws, they. Uh, Rented us houses and uh, rented us a place to stay, and bought us groceries and things. So, my small fellow was still on the breast at the time because the 11 months baby. 
and um, I had to weigh him off the breast when he was like three years old. And uh, then I eventually went and sought a job. The first job that came up was uh, through a connection was in Zimbali Lodge as a cleaner. So um, from there, um, my um, the the head chef called me not the head chef, the executive chef he used to call me to keep uh, cooking like the veg biryanis and the veg uh, I mean veg biryani and veg curries and all because I had like a Monday night. So that's where I really realized because when I was younger I didn't know what I was going to do in my life. So <laughs> that got me to the girl love cooking and baking. So yeah. that got me like into this. But then uh, there was a problem there in Zimbali where I had to leave. But the next job I took um, that was available was in Lifestyles Puspa. And that was the place that I really got into creating food, making mixture with, uh, with different kinds of sauces and spices. It's like uh, uh, this Paul Rankin guy just gave me a rain over to to do anything I want with foods, to create new things. It was such a beautiful time. I really enjoyed it. Yeah. And I got greedy when someone offered me <laughs> another job uh, with more money. So I left spa to go and do that. Yeah. And it wasn't for long. And, you know, if there's young girls who are going through so much rejection, so much you know, having no identity, not wanting, despising being a woman, despising who you were created to be because you feel so unsafe and unprotected. You know, what, what advice would you give them? What, what would you say to them? I will say to them, there's no amount of money in this world. No amount of men or friends that can really get you out from your need or whatever you're feeling like if you was if you're getting abused and um, like i also being in the situation where mm. you feel like you leave this guy there's nothing out there for you because you've got no money you got no education you got nothing besides your metric certificate and you can't make it without this person because if you leave them it's like you're leaving part of them but i will tell them it's within you to be stronger and you can do anything I had to start as a cleaner, a cleaner in Zimbali Lodge. When I say cleaner, I am walking down in the valley of pools. I'm washing and scrubbing uh, this thing, uh, showers and toilets and mopping the floors and mopping the decks around the pool. That's a job. That is for me an income for my child. Even if, uh, if you don't have children, but for you to feel better, to feel that you have something, don't feel like you can't do any job doesn't mean you've been a cleaner that you don't you don't have a job you know you become a low lowly person it doesn't mean if you are doing a job like sweeping the street it's a lowly thing you are getting paid for that you should be not be embarrassed for the payment that you got your own identity that you got something of your own you should be proud of that and leave whatever is hurting you and move on it's so it won't be easy but you have to build yourself within we have the strength to move on. Yeah. You seem so peaceful, Daphne. You seem to have come to a place of healing within yourself. And what can what what made you do that? What helped you to do that? Oh, well, I can tell you, I went to many places of worships and things, but it's not really the place of worship that gives you peace. Mm. It's your love for the Heavenly Father, number one. Your relationship with him. And I, I, just as I'm talking to you, Nish and Desh, I talk to him in the same way. And uh, you can tell him anything. I, I'm sorry, I'm getting emotional. But, no, it's uh, okay. It's okay. I, Take I the really, time. I'm really nothing without my father. Without my Heavenly Dad, I am nothing. And I shouldn't have made it. At this moment, like we don't even have jobs. We don't have much things going on in us. But God sees to us. He protects us. And my God has been faithful to me right from the beginning. 
and I know he's got a big purpose, but um, I got big dreams too. <laughs> but it's his will, not mine. It's his will what he wants me to do. Yeah. Because I don't even know if tomorrow I can go out over there and become the mayor, or if I can uh, sit back here and be an, uh, maybe a, a wife to, an, uh, to a man, or just be a granny looking after kids. I can be anything. It's all in his will what he wants me to do. So my life yeah. won't revolve around what I want, a house, a car, this, that, I, and luxuries. It's more ease work. But I think more it will be in favor of like me, um, maybe having a restaurant and employing women who went through what same thing, those who are rejected in wow. every way. Women who've got nothing and who've been abused and feel like they are nothing. I would like to employ them make an income to make them and build a little bit a little cottages for them to be happy to build themselves up so they can move on I, I i've seen this in a dream many many 10 years ago so i didn't dwell on it because i have to work to pay rent and buy food and things for my children. <laughs> so uh, but just lately sitting in here i realized that i would really like to do that and uh, I'm not the kind of person who likes to sit with that one menu all the time, so I get bored. Yeah. I would like to do things. But what I mainly like to see, these people, some of them are homeless, some of them are missing the children and women. I would like to see the smile on the face, to have a free spirit like what I have, to know who has put that spirit in me. That's what mm. I want. I, I don't need anything in life. I don't need a big house, a big car, but just space enough, ground enough with buildings and a big, massive restaurant <laughs> can bring in, can bring in uh, like an income to help these people. Even if I don't have nothing, even if one match to sleep on the floor, but to see the smile on their face, to know that I'm building someone up, that would be so much. It means so much to this life, which I felt very worthless at the beginning. Wow. Wow, I'm in awe of you, actually, because I just think, um, you know, to, to have gone through so much and not turned bitter, to have gone through so much and still hold on to dreams, that for me is so commendable. Thank you. You should never give up on those dreams, ever especially because it means helping so many other people. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so tell us, you have some Facebook groups, you have a big following, you have your areas of influence that you are putting your message out there into the world. Tell us a little bit about what you think your purpose is now in this time. Well, I can tell you one, I'm not a politician. <laughs> I'll never be one. <laughs> Neither will I like to see myself as a religious person because religion got boundaries around you. Yeah. Uh, like you mustn't be like this, you mustn't be like that, and so forth. That's man made. But I know who my father is, I know my Jesus. Hmm. I, um, I built up groups, like a prayer group called Overcomer. I build up that group because of specific prayer. Um, I got no uh, incline or rejection for anyone who prays in the group. I don't yeah. care whether you're Muslim, Christian, this, that, that. If it's a prayer, it's in the prayer group. You would pray because I, I know in my life there's nothing else that helped me more than prayer. So uh, it's like a platform I built. But only the pastors <laughs> send uh, prayers and and um, what use that as a platform. There's no uh, no one else that comes in. I I don't. My granny and grandfather brought me up never to condemn another religion, never to look down on people and their beliefs. That you must never do. So uh, in the time of uh, really help uh, and really struggles, I can tell you one thing. There's no religious person of a definite thing that helped me. When God sent me angels, earth angels, he sent me the best of the best who will touch my heart. And in turn, I will touch them and pray for them. Uh, but anything, that was the only thing I could give them. And even now too. <laughs> yes. 
so uh, that's overcoming and uh, being through like so much of things that I went through that I can actually come up from there with one thing that is uh, my fellowship, worship, praise, my God. Although I won't sing in public because the shower is better. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but that's it. And then I created a, a group during this lockdown called Lady Violets. That's for Lady Violets. Violets. Yes. yes, that's for abused women and children. And um, I do not uh, allow any kind of um, religion into it or any post with God and things because why? I, we don't want to be specific on, you know, like uh, on religions and things like this. I want, people, yeah. I want these people to know we've got people uplifting them when they need a person to talk to, cry to. It's open. We, we hardly get the likes and posts, but... Uh, uh, my admin, Linda Naidu, Deshni Governor, they are there with me and a couple other women. Um, we try to bring the best into the group. And then there's the midnight coffee uh, cup, which meaning is, it's an, uh, like a midnight for me means a new dawning is about to come. Coffee is a box of treasures. And... Yeah. Um, and then the coffee. So it's more like you can have coffee and music anytime during the morning or night. So I, I created the group mostly because of night shifters. People who work night shift, but uh, I don't even see them talking mostly <laughs> on the group. But uh, it's still at its early ages, uh, stages at least. And I hope that encourages and pick up people. Like, well, uh, most of my posts is to make people laugh. Because I enjoy making them laugh. I, I, I sort of enjoy uh, putting a joy and a smile on someone's face uh, instead of like being glum. And there's something I come on Facebook and I just post about something that is um, just to uplift somebody, anybody. Wow. Wow. That's, that's truly inspirational. Thank you for that. Thank you work that you do and it's important to to not be so um you you're very right because you use the word religious and oftentimes we we attach moral judgment when somebody is being molested or abused and yet it's almost as if you know this is happening and it makes you angry uh, and usually in those times you 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 draw away from god instead of going to him because of the anger and the pain. And uh, so it's important to, to meet people where they at, to meet people where they at. So thank you, thank you for that. Thank you very much. So we must go onto Facebook and, and like your page or contribute to your pages um, if, uh, if, we, if we need to, is that right? Yes. Yeah. And tell me, would you marry again, Daphne? I never given it much thought because of um, in my marriage I went through abuse also. Yeah. Um, and the couple of days before my husband can die, uh, he caught me and he told me I will never trust him. And he put me on the floor and he said, I will never trust any woman the way I trust you. And then he was biting my cheeks and everything. Like it was such a lovely thing because no matter what my husband, what, what I went through, I was, I was loving this man. He can eat me, he can kill me, he can do me anything, but I would love him that much. I will forgive and love him that much for anything he do. I understand a lot of women go through that. <clears throat> you know, I understand that. But then when I think about it later in years, like now, uh, it's actually God's love because he also went through a very bad patch in his life. Uh, they also went through poverty. He also went through pains and hurts and things. He also went through so many kind of... Uh, uh, times you wanted to commit suicide. So, but I still could love this person. And uh, up till now, if I see anybody, even if they did me anything bad, I, I can't really hate that person, I, I swear. It's just God's love, I think, if that's really me. And um, I'm a, well, I can't say like I'm a very righteous person or I'm not a sinner or this thing here yeah, because I'm human. I do wrong things, but I but I won't be in a relationship with a man because I prefer the relationship with God. 
And um, so about marriage, I, I don't see it coming anytime in the future. Because <laughs> I feel I got so much to do out there. And, and I did actually have a relationship with my father, my daddy. Yeah. Then have like um, be restricted in my marriage where I have to, um, like when you marry to a husband, you have to be obedient to him in every way. Uh, I'm, I'm from old school. Yeah. You do this for your husband, you do that. That's how my granny and brought me up. So um, for me, marriage will be like, uh, I cannot divide my, my, my time between the husband and uh, doing what I chose to do. But if that married one, a man on a bill that I have, there's a place for me. It's it's right. <laughs> if he's going to be there for me and go and make this dream come true to help all his ladies and the children, I'll marry him. I swear. I'll make God to make me love him. <laughs> hey, I'm you're joking. Looking a, you're looking for a kingdom covenant partner. That's what you're looking for. <laughs> no. Hey, I'm joking. Eh? It's not true. <laughs> I, I, I will really try it because uh, because of the abuses and all, I, I, I did heal from them. Um, but the thing is, I, would, I, I uh, won't be able to go into a marriage and not think I'm really scared. I swear. <laughs> I'm really scared to get, to get into that. But more, it's because of what I want. It's not what... Uh, uh, not what you're scared for, it's what you want. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's profound. That's profound. Thank you for that. And thank you for your clarity. Uh, tell me, how how did you get out of the drugs? Um, in fact, I got into it because of, uh, you know, when I ran away from home, I told you, I uh, used to sleep on the yeah. and things. So I should just go stand by these guys and uh, get one who pulls out that... Um, Marijuana and smoking, that was to keep yeah. me full when I'm hungry. Yeah. So uh, that's more for me. Then I went, when I went to the place of safety, uh, when I was missing all this, all these things that I was smoking, uh, and uh, it's it sort of like I was locked up. I didn't want to eat. I didn't want to do this, but I was screaming and crying, I know, but I don't know why I'm crying. Yeah. But then I think that was because of the going cold turkey, just pulling yourself away from it. So that's that's the reason why I was saying that. I mean, that's why I got uh, got out of it is because uh, being in a place of safety, there's no access to any of that thing. So that's when that I gave it up. I didn't go. Back. Yeah, there's a lot of things that I try in my life, and I and I don't go back to it because. Maybe I'm strong-willed, or maybe I don't like it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, And you know, one of the things that you talk about is having raised, having to raise your children by yourself, and uh, you know, going back and working as a cleaner. You must have, it must have been difficult because cleaners usually work shifts and things like. How did you manage to get around? What was, what was that like? What was that experience about? All my working life, I never ever paid for public transport or had a set transport. I always hike, whether it's morning, whether it's afternoon, whether it's night, I am hiking. How I do it is because I pray before I hike. I know yeah. my heavenly father will send these angels for me. I'm not lying. Even lately, uh, when I was working here at the casino <clears throat> in Ampangeni, um, I've been there for, they should have been on my third year there. Um, the security guards will stand with me when I'm waiting for people to pass through the casino and I'll ask them if I can get a lift back to, to where I'm staying. She will come and she'll see I'm staying there standing sometime one hour, two hours, gone into the early hours, like one o'clock. And she'll tell you, I know your God will take you home, I know. She will do the thing, she will tell them so. So wherever I Okay, I think we've lost a signal there just for a minute. Let's give Daphne um, a chance to reconnect. Desh, can you unmute me? Yeah. What a story. Let's, I'm just gonna contact her. 
But what a story, what a woman, hey? Well, it's such an inspiring story, you know, although it's filled with so much of tragedy and, um, you know, pain and anguish, um, I'm still seeing all the strength and the hope and the courage and the determination. And I'm still seeing this bubbly kind of person, which you don't normally you know, you, you don't normally get these kind of people. So I'm thinking that her life was definitely, you know, fueled by a specific purpose. Yeah. And uh, look at her wanting to have a restaurant to actually employ other abused women. I mean, this, this is phenomenal. Yeah. yeah. And very much like, you know, how a lotus grows, you know, in that murky, dirty water. And then, you know, yes. And you see, you know, above the water, that beautiful plant. This is what yeah. I'm actually seeing. And, and you know what? My philosophy is um, the more you lift other people, you know, the more your own path is illuminated. And yes. I kind of see this, you know, with Daphne. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's such crazy, a... Shani. You know, we just connected via uh, Facebook. You know, mm -hmm. it's almost like, uh, you know, uh, our energies kind of uh, met each other, you know, our souls kind of connected very much like you and I. Yeah, it's got, a, it's got, I don't call it coincidence, I call it God incidents, where people who are meant to do something together come together, you know? Yes. Yeah, so it's incredible. I'm not sure that she's going to be able to get back on. But um, while we're waiting, uh, Desh, I want to tell you about the project that we're busy with and where we get um, reusable sanitary towels to girls in, um, who are unable to afford um, feminine hygiene products. You know, I spent some time um, in um, Eastern Cape uh, and just really spent some time in, in, the, in the immersion and worked with the girls there and really the amount of, um, what is, the amount of uh, risk that they are under because they stay at home alone in a home. They miss a week of school. 75% of absenteeism is due to a girl having a period and not being able to go to school. And remember in those areas, they still don't have running water. So there's no um, toilets like we have at home. There's no um, electricity even. And uh, it's quite traumatic for the girls. And you know, one of the worst choices a girl has to make, even if she could get pads, is whether to buy a packet of pads or whether to buy a packet of bread or pup for her family. And usually the girl chooses the other. And so it, it's very sad. And if you want to get involved, Facebook family, if you want to get involved and help these um, girls, please just connect with us. Leave me a Facebook message. Um, go and like our page called Seeds of Hope as well. Yeah, this new, you know, you've, uh, I'm just going to contact Daphne now, hold on. Okay, you've known her for a little while now. I mean, what, what have been some of the key things that you have learned from her, or even just listening from her now? She's such a hopeful, encouraging person. And, uh, you know, I, I mean, I see the posts that she uh, she posts on Facebook, you know, to Lady Violets, you know, I'm the administration of Lady Violets and the Overcomer Group. And recently, you know, it's this Midnight Coffers Coffee. Um, you know, it's such uplifting, such inspiring um, messages, you know, to each one. She'll be giving people advice. Um, she's just such a phenomenal person. Mm, mm, mm. she is and I mean she she I think she's very much salt of the earth and that's what I wanted I wanted us to get a story from a real life person who's still on the ground who's still struggling and I mean I know that that um, COVID has been very difficult on her to get work you know uh, but that hasn't stopped her bubbly spirit that hasn't stopped her from um, being an inspiration and helping other people to smile and, you know, for that, I am truly in gratitude um, for her, for her deep soul and her, and her love for people, you know. And uh, remember, Nish, there are, we're living in such trying times now, you know, and uh, there are so many people out there, you know, who could be facing the similar kind of challenges, you know, that yeah. she's uh, encountering right now. And, uh, you know, um, 
So uh, she's sending a very positive message, you know, to all of them, you know, um, keep going, you know, things yeah. will get better. Yeah. And you know, the fact that she said, you know, you can leave, although you think you can't, you can leave, you know, at 16 to, to leave home and not having a real home and a real family from the time she was five, at 16, to have the courage to run away from home with no way to go. Um, and thank God she ended up in a, in a place of safety. But, you know, just to have done that, just to escape the horror of abuse, you know, um, that for me is tragic. It really is tragic, you know. And yet she's made a life for herself. Yet she's made a life for herself. I kind of foresee her, you know, even like, um, you know, going into the schools and chatting to children, you know. Yes. Um, uh, you know, sharing her story and, you know, somehow the, the, the kids, you know, those who are experiencing, you know, similar kind of issues, you know, in their families as well, you know, will we'll be able to actually draw on, on her strength and her courage. Yeah, yeah. So, Nishni, if there's anything I can ask you, what is your message of hope? You're on the air. What is your message of hope today? Because I know you work in the space of of uh, gender-based violence and um, what is your message of hope? Um, to everyone, you know, whether you're woman, whether you're man, you know, we're living in such trying times now and, uh, you know, one just needs to be focused, uh, one just needs to be strong and uh, remember that, you know, we just here for a specific time. So I always say, you know, just do good and be good that's all we can do. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. And we're looking forward to the date when you're going to be interviewed on Seeds of Hope, because I know you're a, you're a treasure book. <laughs> yeah, you're a treasure book. <laughs> so thank you. I think, um, I think we have no staff need. Might be um, um, uh, a problem with connection. However, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to chat to her offline. And if you have any questions, if you have any concerns, if you are in the situation and you don't know where to turn, please inbox either Deshni or myself. We will connect you with somebody that can, that can help if you need to get out of a situation. I'm sure there's, there's ways, um, but also don't, just don't say, stay silent. Take that first step and tell somebody if you're in the situation. And um, to Daphne, in her absence, I just want to say thank you so much. You have been an inspiration and continue to be an inspiration. And I know that your story is going to help many people. And my, my blessing and my wish for you is that your dream comes true. So keep dreaming. You know, Daphne, keep dreaming. Keep dreaming about that restaurant, about the food that you love and the creativity that you want to bring into this world um, through food. Because your dreams inspire others and God will use that. And um, is there anything else you'd like to add, Desh, before we, we close? Uh, to you, Nishani, thank you so much. This is an amazing platform for people to actually share their stories. Um, I thought perhaps, you know, um, at some stage, you know, Daphne should actually write a book about her story. Um, yeah. I feel it's very inspiring. And um, yes, thank you so much. And um, uh, goodbye to the, to the listeners, to the viewers. Yeah. Goodbye, Facebook family, and thank you for joining us. I'm sorry that we lost Daphne, but if you have any questions, comments, please give her the encouragement that she needs, and let's connect um, via the social media platform. Um, she is in Richard's Bay. Thank you, Desh, for, for being Daphne's support, for being her, her uh, you know, pull of strength so that she could do this today. It's the first time she's sharing her story, so we are very, very, very proud of her. And to the Facebook family, remember to like Seeds of Hope, remember to connect with us, and may God bless you, may God make his face to shine upon you, and may hope always light your way. Goodbye. Goodbye.